Hello, my name is Adam Murray and welcome to Extra Time. Today we are joined by a real legend of the game. During his career, he won two All-Ireland titles, five Munster titles, three league medals and a phenomenal five All-Stars. He's often been described as the greatest goalkeeper to ever play the game. We are thrilled to have Brendan Cummins with us tonight. Welcome to the podcast, Brendan. Well, Adam, how's it going, boy? Um, I want to start uh, at the start of your career and... Uh, what was it like joining the Tip Ireland panel as a young fellow with fellas you would have watched uh, win all Ireland as you grew up? Well, it's a little bit weird, I suppose. When I uh, when I joined the Tip panel, it was an awful lot different than when you joined the panel now. Um, my father got a phone call on the Monday before the game against Waterford Blown Capaquin, the National League, November 1993, to say, will Brendan come along for the league game on Sunday? And of course, the father said, yeah, and I spoke to Babs on the phone, I think. And next thing you know, I'm inside in the dressing room on the Sunday morning inside in care with Nicky English and Pat Fox and John Lahey. I hadn't trained with Tip. I'd never met any of these fellas before. And um, fellow Dwyer's was full back in front of me. I remember Noel Sheehy he'd been there. Uh, John Lahey was very, very good to me. And we actually did the warm up in uh, in care, in the J pitch in care. And then we got in the bus and drove 40 minutes over to Capaquin. So it'll tell you how different things were back then. Um, but yeah, it was. It was it was a weird one because I had followed Tipperary Hurling, but maybe not as crazy as others. I'd gone to the um, 89 All-Ireland final uh, when they beat, beat Antrim, but I hadn't been at any other All-Ireland finals. And to be honest, I hadn't been at many Tipperary Senior Hurling matches either. So I was kind of more focused on go in and stop the ball and go home because I thought I'd only get one game. So it was it was it was fairly surreal when um, Pat Fox and all walked into the dressing room. All right, but they were lovely, uh, even though they did keep their distance the first time because I was only young and knew who I was. Um, but I was lucky that day that the game quite went quite well for me below in that uh, cap of Quinn, and um, I suppose it all took off from there. And you mentioned uh, warming up and then getting on a bus to drive to the match, but. Uh... How do you think uh, the game has changed in terms of like preparation, training and different styles of play since you, since you started playing? Hush, look, it's, it's absolutely night and day. You sometimes feel you're playing with the dinosaurs um, when you look back at what we were doing in 93, 94, 95 and all that. Um, certainly the video work, the strength and conditioning, um, attention to detail by managers... But we got the first sign of that probably in um, when Nick English took over. Um, Nicky took over the team in uh, 1999. And that was the first time we'd done one-to-ones where you sit down with the manager and he tells you what he expects of you and you have a bit of a chat. So Nicky started to bring the whole man management thing to the next level. Now, we certainly didn't have any Sabutio boards out showing you styles of play or tactics. There was no obviously no video work. But now I'm involved in the backroom team and a couple of county teams and all that. And you'll see that the attention to detail that you do with your players now is completely different. Like, I mean, I'll take you back to when I was when I was playing uh, nearly, I suppose, we'll go back to maybe 2009, 2010, 2011. I was watching YouTube videos of the forwards I was going to be playing against. Um, Liam Sheedy actually got us these devices that uh, Enfer... Uh, Louis Ronan had bought for us. They were about the size of your hand, right? Nowadays, the GoPro cameras, you know, that size. But these devices were had to be brought to, to be uploaded with the fellow you'd be playing against the next day. So it had started to evolve, but certainly in the last five years or six years or so, the game has gone absolutely through the roof with preparation. The science behind the game is probably, uh, is gone way up. And of course, there's more money around county teams as well. Don't forget that. So that's given them the the ammo, I suppose, to, to get more adventurous and get more scientific. And Brendan, um, I suppose, when I look, say, the, the evolution of goalkeeping as well, you would have come in and, like, at the time, Ken Hogan, he would have been a legend and he would have had two all the medals. I mean, did you feel pressure, you know, stepping into his shoes? Uh, I suppose you would go on to become a legend, but that would have uh, folded a lot of your lesser people. No, I think, I, I, I suppose as a youngster, I was uh, maybe, I don't know what you call it, selfish. It's sometimes to say if you've got to achieve huge things in life, it's to be selfish about what you're, what you're going at doing. And I just pretty much focused on myself in the early years and made sure that I got to the best uh, what ability I had. Now, Ken Hogan was there and he was a massive help to me, an absolute massive help to me now. Like when we, when I had that game below in Capaquin, I remember being on the bus coming out of Capaquin and he was sitting in front of me. 
And um, the radio was on, of course. They were saying that Tipperary had found a new goalie to replace Ken Hogan. And I remember Ken turning to me and saying, like, they're talking about you, Brendan. Well done. You had a great game today. Now, that took fair going. Do you know what I mean? Like, he like to turn around to Youngfla, who potentially could take his place and say that. Like, that was probably the biggest lesson I got. And it took with me all through that humility, I suppose, I took with me all through my career. So... I wasn't supposed to play actually uh, in two thousand in ninety five. Ken was gone, and Jody Grace was to be the goalie, but he broke his thumb in training. So I played the first round of the championship because Jody's back was at him, and I against Watford actually it turned out, and I was absolutely useless. And um, so, but Jody broke his finger in training the following week, and I had to play against Limerick, and that was the game probably that that gave me the confidence to to drive on. So back to your original point, I wasn't ever. When you're young, you see no danger. Um, I actually saw more danger playing in my last All Ireland final in 2011 than I saw playing in my first one in 1997. I was probably more afraid in 11 than I was in 97, you know, or in India yeah, in 97. So age is a killer that way. You see more pitfalls, you see more problems. Young, you're just going, this is great crack. I'm going to go out and play in an All Ireland final or play for Tipperary. Then I'll go to the disco after and have a right crack. So that was kind of the way it went like. And. Uh... You mentioned uh, Nicky English there. Uh, and in 2001, he was managing you when you won your first All Ireland final. But uh, what do you think uh, you did differently or changed to allow you to get over the line in that situation? Um, there's a few things, Cam. When Nicky took over in, uh, in 1998, <coughs> we, Claire were in their, in their pomp. Claire were the ones to beat. Like. And Claire's game was all about running, it was all about aggression. Um, it was just angry stuff. So Nicky knew we had the hurling. So suddenly we were up, we were up in uh, Sleeve We were running up and down the mountain. And we were going to boot camps. This is something we'd never done before. I mentioned the one-to-ones earlier. All that stuff started to happen for us. And then we started to get gear. So Nicky had this kind of thing going with Adidas. So suddenly we'd Adidas gear, which we'd never gotten before. We were well looked after, tracksuits. Everything was absolutely on point. So I suppose as a player, you felt you were in a more professional setup. But probably the, the, the biggest thing that Nicky did then was in 98 and uh, 99 and 2000, we were nearly there, nearly there. And then he said, look, lads, there's no Ireland final played on the side of a mountain. And he had the panel he wanted from the previous two years of hardship. And we focused way more on hurling. We focused, focused way more on the way we played. And back then, Nicky actually coached the team as well. So it's not like... He was manager with a coach, we'll say, in the background, like we'll say Kylie and Kinnerk have now in Limerick or Liam Cahill and Mikey Beavis have in Watford. So he was doing it all himself. But, I mean, Nicky was the, was the one. He was an inspirational figure, but really he modernised the approach to the game, put players front and centre, and the way he spoke to you just inspired you. And I think that was probably why we made the breakthrough in um, in, 2000 and, in 2001 in a tight game against Galway in, in Dublin, which we normally would have lost in the past. Um, Brendan, you played both inter-county in football and hurling. Was, was it hard to balance that going through the years, playing the two of them? Um, initially, it wasn't. Um, Jack, it wasn't that hard initially um, because the footballers, you just turned up for the matches. Um, I played a football Munster final league in 1994. I remember Mark and Brian Corcoran. Uh, I'm, and uh, I remember I, I was playing wing forward, but I probably ended up marking him because I was so kind of overawed by the fact that I was marking this fellow who was an absolute legend even at that age in the game. Um, but there was a big turning point, I think, in, in the football. And I saw a sea change. It was in 2002, we got to the Munster football final. And it was in 2000, the January or February 2002, we played league game above in Leash against Leash. And... I remember after the game, I think we won by a point or two. It was a real dogged game. And Declan Brown stood up, well, who I'd be related to now, Declan's a cousin of mine, in the dressing room after the game. He said, Brendan, you're either taking this football seriously or not. And if you're not, he said, get out of the dressing room now. And I was going, oh, Jesus, like, you can't say that to me kind of thing. You know, I'm hurling as well. I'm doing you a favour, turning up for football and all this kind of stuff. You kind of have that in your head that you'd be saying, well, you know, I'm, you know the lads will need me here. Like, but... Um, when Declan said that to me, it opened my eyes and I said, you know what, you're either in it or you're not, and he's right. And I said, no, Declan, I'm in 100%. And then I trained four or five nights a week. I trained with the footballers and the hurlers all through 2002. And we got to a Munster football final and probably 
last weekend being the most historic weekend of Tipperary football, we had the opportunity to do that in 2002 and we kind of blew it a little bit. So it was hard to juggle it and balance it, um, especially when the pressure went on like that. But that's only the way it had to be. And I think nowadays it is absolutely impossible to be a dual player. You just can't do it full stop. You see it at underage and under 17 level, you can't do it. That's just the way it is. And I was probably at the tail end of, of my career in football when all this bit in and I just couldn't commit anymore. And it was a sign that Tipperary footballers were getting really serious about it as well. And Brendan, do you think... Go on, go on, sir. Go on, go on, go on. And do you think like uh, some more structures could be put in place to maybe allow lads play both football and hurling or commit to both and properly? No, no. It's gone. That ship has sailed. There's no dual players inter-county anymore. If you take it, if you're in a senior inter-county hurling our football team, just like we'll just take the, the tip set up. We'll say they're doing weights on Monday night. They train Tuesday. They do weights on Wednesday. They rest Thursday. They train Friday. They train Saturday and they play a match on Sunday. Now, I don't know where in the name of God you're supposed to put structures in place to play football in the middle of that. Because the footballers are doing exactly the same thing. Two brave footballers are doing the same lifting they're doing the same training, they're doing everything the same, the dietitian, the video analysis, the games assessments, the one-to-ones, all that kind of stuff uh, has to be done. It has to be fit in around your life if you have one. Uh, so I don't think it's ever, ever going to be possible to, for somebody to play both. And if they are, to be honest with you, they're kind of codding themselves because they're splitting themselves in half. And I think this is elite, elite sport, professional sport nearly now. And you couldn't ask uh, an English soccer player to go off and play a rugby match, play rugby union as well. Do you know what I mean? You just couldn't do it. You have to commit. And that's the way it is now, I'm afraid. It's sad to the traditionalist. At club level, you can. And even some places, they don't like you doing it at club level. Uh, that's not an unusual statement either. But at inter-county level, I'm afraid it's, it's over from that point of view. Brendan, if we go back to your own career, um, I suppose you mentioned the Great Clare team. Well, they won two All Irelands, and then okay, there was a you know Kilkenny, Cork had odd All Irelands, and then I suppose Cork came again. When when did you start, first start to see the difference in goalkeeping from say just getting the ball, hitting it as long as you possibly can to your half forward line to that short, um, you know, precise puck outs that we see? Like the lads there now, they just take it for granted that the goalkeeper, you know, half a hurley out to a guy's hand. But like that, that there's been a sea change that's been happening over in the last. 10, 15 years. When did you kind of say to yourself, this is the way the game is going? Uh, I'd say it was 2000. We lost the Munster final in 2000 and Donald Cusack had been pinging puck outs to Halpine and Gardner and these boys and uh, I think it was Sherlock was in the corner and they were working the ball up the pitch. That was their style of play and I remember a few of the lads had said to me, why can't you be like Donald Logan hit the ball out short? And I was kind of saying to him, well, why can't you be like John Gardner and go into space to give me a chance to do it? And we had that to and fro. And we never we never really nailed it in Tipperary, to be honest with you. But it was 2000, I think, when Cork won that All-Ireland then, played a running game through the middle third. Like They weren't a massively big team with the O'Connors uh, in, the, in that middle section of the pitch. So they had to change the style of play. Um, so it was probably then that it started Damien Fitzhenry, remember, in the Leinster final one year when Wexford Jacob scored that last goal uh, to knock Kilkenny out of the championship. Fitzhenry was hitting the ball into the grass above Crow Park, which was, again, a big thing at the time that he wasn't going long. So he was starting to buy into it. But I really didn't get it until Eamon O'Shea took over in um, 2008. And uh, I had to change my swing. I had to change the way I hit the ball. I had to change the hurley I used. Everything had to change because Eamon said to me, look, you're going to be the quarterback. If we're going to play, you have to set the tone. So he then spoke to the forwards and he spoke to me and he put squares around the pitch and he told me the ball has to go into this square head high all the time. So I practiced that. But little did I know, I suppose, that he was probably talking to the forwards, saying, you need to leave that square free. And as Brendan is hitting the ball, you sprint into that square and catch it. So it's that relationship between the, the goalkeeper and the receiver is absolutely key. And that's where the modern science has come in with video analysis and all. Because players, you look at the Limerick game against Watford, I showed it on the Sunday game. Limerick had said to Kyle, Watford had said the wing back can get the ball. Kyle, Limerick noticed that Kyle Hayes got a load of puck outs but he didn't kill Watford with that shot puck outs because Watford had a plan for when he got it what they were going to do next so I mean that side of the game has gone really really like a game of chess what I would say in 2008 was the first time and I really didn't get it 
until the middle of 2009, if I'm to be honest about it. And then I got better hitting it out and our team got better then on dead ball situations. But Cusack was probably the first uh, to start all of that towards the, that side of the game, to be fair to him. He was the one who, who started that type of play. And uh, in 2008 and 2009, you were saying your probably rival Kenny would uh, probably been going strong. And it wasn't until 2010 when you beat him in the all Ireland final that you managed to get over the line. Uh, what, was it more important to, to, to win beating Kilkenny than just to win? And uh, what was it like playing that rivalry? Yeah, look, it was, it was, it was mad stuff. It was, a, it was a huge challenge now because we had come from nowhere, you could say. Like we had been in the, the wilderness or whatever you want to call it, in Tipperary Hurling. Um, it had been eight or nine years since it won in All Ireland. Like I played in oh four, five, six, seven, eight, up along the line nine, and we hadn't really gotten to finals. So yeah, Kilkenny won a big one. I think the big change for us was that in the two thousand and nine All Ireland, in the two thousand and nine League final, was probably the game that told us that we were ready to win, because Kilkenny had beaten us by five goals in the league. Uh, they scored five goals in the first half, actually below Nolan Park. Uh, I remember Martin Comfort chipped me for the last goal. Kilkenny supporters were shouting, lock the doors and make them watch it. The tip supporters who were leaving. It was a lonely place in that dressing room in Nolan Park. Liam Sheedy managed it unbelievably well. And then we played the league final and we said, no matter what happens today, we are not taking a step backwards. It doesn't matter. Get, if everybody gets sent off, well, then that's fine. There'll be nobody left and that's okay too. And I think it showed when Declan Fanning hit Martin Comfort coming on. Comfort came on as a sub and there was black cards. So Comfort came on as a sub, Fanning hit him, turned him upside down and the two of them got black cards and Comfort was sent off even before he got onto the pitch. So that was the shots fired um, for us. And then we lost the final in 09, which was the loneliest dressing room I have ever, ever, ever been in in my whole life. You had young men crying. I mean now just sitting there, no towel over their heads, just sitting there looking at the floor and the tears dropping onto the floor. I'll never forget Shane McGrath. He was sitting on the toilets in, um, in Crow Park there at the sink section leading into the toilets. And he just sat there and the tears, I, I, even now I, I just get emotional thinking about it. The tears rolling down his face. Paddy Maher, massive hunk of a fella like, and the tears rolling down his face and that hurt us. So when we were bet by Cork, we had a meeting on the Tuesday night after that. And I knew after that meeting we were going to win the All Ireland, and I couldn't wait to get Kilkenny again. I couldn't wait. I was praying to God it'd be Kilkenny, and it was. And we beat him then, obviously in that final. And you're dead right. People say you stopped them the five in a row. That didn't matter a jot to me, to be honest with you. I didn't care to tiddly wings. I was playing Kilkenny, and I wanted to win it. And they kept beating us in it. So the fact we got over the line then, and it was Kilkenny, it just fate meant it had to be Kilkenny because they're the ones we wanted at the end of that year. Brendan, I, I was at that game and um, I, I remember thinking to myself, I was up in the, up in, right in the Davin stand and looking down and I was able to see the movement of your forwards that day. And I actually said to myself, this team, this cheap team, there's no one going to beat this cheap team for the next five years if they play like this. It was probably the most complete performance I've ever seen from anyone. And you could, you could have played five sweepers against you that day, but the ability of your lads to move into space, all six forwards interlock it. And you mentioned Damon O'Shea here, and we have, we have the great Billy Welsh here. He's a regular contributor on the podcast. He's always talking about Eamon O'Shea. Um, and like, they, then you go, you know, you go from that, and then the next couple of years, you go back into the wilderness. Like the continuity is so mm. important. Like you know, in, because no, you know, in tip, like oftentimes you're you're accused of you can't put back to back together. But like you mentioned it there for for a county like tip, they go nine, ten years of winning in all Ireland. Like it, it, even next year, it must be so important that Sheedy's back again next year with him and O'Shea to keep that continuity going to give yourself a chance to be competitive every year. Yeah, you just do. And I think probably what Tip will need to do is to build a system. If you're in Tipperary, you can be sometimes spoiled with choice. I mean, that movement you spoke about, like, I can't remember doing a huge amount of video analysis and all this kind of stuff. But if you have Larry and Noel McGrath and Noel Kelly and Garrod Ryan and Bonner Mar and these guys, they will instinctively bounce off each other. I think that a little bit of the issue is that you need to have a process. You need to have a style of play like what Limerick have for all the world. And that gives you longevity of winning. Um, and even when Limerick lost last year, you can see the way they bounce back again. So Tip now do are in a transition. I've no doubt Liam will, will stick around. 
2010, we had Monday All Ireland under 21 final in 2010 as well, and it did look like we were on the roll. But Liam Levin took a huge amount out of us. Like I remember I, where I was, it was downstairs when I got the text and I rang him and O'Shea straight away and I said, "Why are you leaving?" And he said, well, it's not really me. He said, I think Liam is going, he said. You know, and I said, all right, okay. And I didn't work the following day. That was a Wednesday. I didn't work on the Thursday. I couldn't function. Like, I gave the whole day shut down going, like, it's like being on a drug. Someone had turned off the tap, like. So, and then Declan Ryan obviously came in and, and himself and Tommy Dunn got us to an All-Ireland final. But then we fizzled out. So next year with Liam and the lads, there's a transition period, I believe, in Tipperary. I don't believe at all in, in getting rid of the older fellas. If that was the case, Kevin Moore shouldn't be playing in the All-Ireland semi-final on, on, on Sunday and, and Saturday evening. In reality, he's been one of the best players Warford had. Why? Because Callum Lyons, the Burka, he's got legs all around him. So the cuteness is still there. The know-how in the dressing room to settle players is still there. And on the pitch, he can still do his job because others are supporting him. So I think that's, that's going to be key. But Tip have won under 20 titles, under 21. So there's plenty of young players there. It's just a matter of blending them in. I think it's good that Liam will be there to be the one to blend them in. And uh, throughout your career, uh, you managed to win uh, five All-Star awards. And uh, a lot of players say the most enjoyable time they ever had was meeting up with lads at the All-Stars and getting to know fellas uh, from different counties. Uh, what were the trips away with them guys like? Oh, they were good crack. <laughs> they were good crack, I'll tell you. Yeah, they're, they're like in 2009, right? It's probably the best way. We were in Buenos Aires and poor old Maradona, God rest him now, in his hometown. So, 2009, Kilkenny had beaten us in that All Ireland final, and uh, we were fairly low now. Uh, and uh, so, it was a pub called the Kilkenny. If ever in Buenos Aires, you should go to it, right? So, we were all in the Kilkenny anyway, the Tip and Kilkenny lads. So, the crack started anyway, and uh, that year, Henry Shefflin was doing adverts with Lucasade. And it was all about the last five minutes and getting the drink into you and all that, right? So we're all around the bar anyway. And Larry says to Martin, come for it. Geez, Larry, when you, Martin, when you got to, of course, that's his nickname. Got when you scored that goal, you had some ugly face on your face and the camera. It's fair embarrassing. Like, you had the hands up like that, right? So with that anyway, Gorta, as quick as you like, turned around to Larry and said, hey, Larry, said, we're telling you all year. He said, Henry's on the telly all year telling you and you're not listening. And Larry was kind of, Larry looks at him, squinting at him like, you know, what are you talking about? Well, he's on the telly all the time telling you about the last five minutes and how important it is, Larry, and you forgot, and you forgot, and we caught you. And it was just the funniest thing ever the way he came out of it because, you know, we were going, eh, do you know what? He's actually right, like they did beat us in the last five minutes and Henry was telling us all year. So there's brilliant camaraderie. Uh, and even on that All-Star Tour then, uh, Dear McCarran was the referee who gave away the dodgy penalty. And uh, he didn't get his All-Ireland medal. Um, so we're in Hurlingham is the name of the, the place where the hurling pitch is in Buenos Aires. So we're in the clubhouse there. And uh, Dear McCarran went up to collect his All-Ireland medal and all the Kilkenny fellas gave him a standing ovation. He got up to collect it. They were cheering, only fire you there, by, and he was mortified. And on the way down, we gave him a standing ovation saying, yeah, good man, well done, no hard feelings on this side. So the banter, and we'd have killed each other on the pitch, but the banter is unbelievable. I've been fortunate. I've been on four All-Star trips. I was in Buenos Aires twice. I was in San Fran. I was in Phoenix and Las Vegas as well. And you know what? They say about hurling this and hurling that, but I'm blessed. I've seen the world thanks to, thanks to hurling, and those trips were just very, very special. There's no doubt about it, yeah. And uh, Brendan, you played in goal for all your hurling county career. Would you like to play in any other position around the field for a tip? Uh, wing forward is where I'd like to play. That when I retired in thirteen, um, I played out the field for the club. So I played wing forward um, in the intermediate hurling championship all that year. I played out there because I didn't want to play in the goals because I felt if I was started playing well in there, I'd have huge regrets. So I wanted a clean break. So I played out the field, but wing forward is where I'd love to have played, yeah, absolutely. Plant the feet and swing it over the bar with the big hurley. It'd be great. And uh, Brendan, I remember one time um, reading an article with Kieran McGeaney there, and he was saying that, you know, the Armagh team that won the All-Ireland in, uh, I think it was 2002, they were a good team, but they weren't a great team because they could never win a, a second. And I suppose, look, from your own point of view, we've often talked about uh, resilience and mental health here. And look, it's been it's been spoken about a lot of times, but, you know, Babs and yourself, and then Babs gets rid of you. 
And it, the easiest thing you would could could have been for you would have been retire, throw your hands out, you know, throw your toys out of the pram. But like you would have your one All Ireland medal, but you come back. Not only do you come back, then you win All Ireland, and you 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 put up a couple of All Stars on top of it. Like that resilience. Um, like, do you feel like you know in your own career that's served you in good stead? Did you always have that, or did you just was a stubbornness to prove him wrong? Well, I think even from it wasn't to prove him wrong. It, like, I think the battle is always that the, the bar for me was always Damien Fitzhenry. Um, he was the one I had to catch every night of training. It was Damien Fitzhenry going to play really well the weekend. If you, I, for me, I all I, I never wanted to play the game and be forgotten. That was a big driving force for me. I just didn't want to be a fella who just played in the goals of Tipperary. I wanted to be a remember, right? And that was a big driving force for me. So I trained harder, I trained longer. And when Babs told me that in the horse and jockey, or we're starting Jerry tonight, Brendan, like, yeah, you're right. The whole world started crashing down. I had the tears welling up in the back of my eyes. It was frustration. It was temper. I asked why. And then they told me a little bit that wasn't really that satisfactory. What were they supposed to say in reality? And I went out and I rang my dad and I rang my father-in-law. And I said, what shall I do? And they said, do nothing. Be the best, be the best sub goalie that, um, that Tipperary ever had tonight. And we'll talk about it over a cup of tea later on when you get home. So that's what I did. And then I suppose I, when I woke up then on Sunday morning after the match, it's then it really dawns you that it was all gone. And uh, then I just started a diary. From that Monday, I did a diary. Every morning I go to work a half an hour earlier, I'd write into the diary. I still have the diary to this day. It ends up about 50 or 60 Word document pages long every day without fail for a half an hour, 40 minutes in the morning. I'd write down how I felt, what was going on in my life, a few goals that I was going to do next. And every single day, that was the process. And I went in training then, um, and I trained harder. After training, I waited around for half an hour, 40 minutes every night. Um, and then at the end of the year, the All-Stars were on. And I went down to the pitch and I trained the night of the All-Stars. And I said to myself, this time next year, I'm the world is going to know what I'm capable of doing. And fortunately, Liam Sheedy arrived on and gave me an opportunity. I took it. And then the All-Stars were, were on the following year and I got one. So when I got home the following night, I went down to the pitch and I put the all-star in the middle of the pitch and I trained again. And that's what I did. Because for me, the all-star was kind of recognition that the hard work was working, but it wasn't the finish because we hadn't won the All-Ireland in 2008. We'd been beaten by Waterford in the All-Ireland semi-final in a game that I felt that we should have done ourselves better and more justice on and we didn't. So Waterford jumped the fence. So I was like a lunatic still and the fire was even stronger then because then my eyes were focused on we need to win all Ireland now because my years are running out. So I think you build resilience by backing yourself. You build it by having friends close to you. I had a sports psychologist, Declan Kyle, who was extremely helpful. He was the person I could talk to because you need someone you can bounce ideas off as a safe zone, somebody who listen to you and give you a bit of perspective. Um, and he was the one for me. Um, also, what I did was, and, and it was something I'd been, I, I had been doing, was doing video diaries as well. And even to this day, I'd still do them. So if I had a good night's training or after the All-Stars, I would video myself and say, on the way up in the car, I'd stop the car. Or then one of the All-Star nights, I sat above in the bed. I just took out the phone and I talked into it. And I said, you're about to go downstairs to pick up an All-Star. You're a paranoid fecker. Do you know what I mean? You're always thinking you're not good enough. You're always thinking today will be the day you'll be found out. You're always doubting yourself. You do all those things, but remember, like, behind it all, you can do it when it counts. So if I'm going in on the bus and I'm having huge doubts in my head, which you always will have, like, nobody's bulletproof. The voice in the back of your head is always, always there now. Anyone who tells you otherwise, I think, is, is cotton you. But I used to take out the phone then the odd time, and I'd look at it. Like, the All-Ireland semi-final, we played Watford. I was looking at what I had said uh, in, in 2008, in that bedroom before I clicked to the All-Star because the gremlins were starting to come a little. And there you are sitting on the side of the bed with a tux on you and you're bowed as a dog and you're cheeky out and you're going, hey, why are you so, what are you doing like? What? You're watching this because you don't have confidence. You're about to go down and collect an All-Star. You're able to do it. What are you afraid of like? Do you know what I mean? So you need to give these little reminders or triggers to yourself 
are the key, I suppose, to, to that resilience. Because remember, everybody is flawed. Everybody will have doubts. Everybody feels brittle a lot of the time. But if you have a mechanism in place that helps you cope when that comes, then you'll get over it. You'll attack it. Coping is probably the wrong word. You'll attack the problem and you'll move on. And you, like, you don't operate with wing mirrors as best you can. But it's not simple. And it's, something, it's a skill. And it's like every skill. I think you have to practice it every day of the week. I do it with work. I do it with sport. Even now, I'm involved with the Kerry Hurlers. I try to work with them on it. Every day you have to grow and every day you have to try to enhance that resilience that you have. You can never take your eye off it. And uh, just coming back to the matches that have been on recently, and I uh, mentioned the football earlier. Just quickly, what was it like to uh, see the tip footballers get over the line at the weekend? Ah, look, it was look, it's magic to see the footballers. It was just as a lump in your throat stuff, like um, because for so long, like I had been there for a fair while, uh, committed, half committed, and all the different phases of that that I went through, but. It's, 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 it's unbelievable because I know what David Power has, has gone through with them at minors. They've under 21. Fox had lost the Munster final by a point the last kick of the game. They had lost the under 21 All-Ireland final to Tyrone. Um, but eventually it comes to a point where you're fed up of losing as a group. And that's what it was the weekend now. And when you have Conor Sweeney and Mike Quinn Living and um, Colin Reardon and these lads, O'Brien gave a couple of years hurling which probably burned up a couple of his football years. Um, and there's our own life from our own club, Gavin Whelan's on the panel. So it just touches your community an awful lot more now because the two lads been here. So it was just fantastic. And it goes to show you what can be achieved if you stick with it, I suppose, is the, is the key. Now, you'd be hoping you wouldn't have to stick with it for 86 years, but at the same time, uh, eventually you get your turn and they were there and ready to take it. So looking ahead to the semi-finals at the weekend, uh, Limerick playing Galway and Walford against Kilkenny. How do you see these games panning out, Brendan? I see these games, first of all, as a disaster. The Tipperary aren't in any of them. <laughs> but having said that, then moving on, uh, I think we start with probably Saturday night. I got Kilkenny and, um, and Walford. I think Walford had an unbelievable display in the Munster final. I don't like the whole gallant losers tag is not something that you want, but they really, really showed green shoots of, of getting somewhere and that all really came to a head then against Clare so they're on a they're on a huge high they probably will have to engage I think Kilkenny further up the pitch than against Limerick they let Limerick come to um, about their about 50-55 yards in their own goal I think Kilkenny will bomb the ball in the square then and put Prunty in the boys under a bit more pressure but I think Watford have a huge opportunity now because there's a goal threat I think under Derek McGrath in fairness when um what you call it, when Shane Bennett was inside in the full forward line, he was a kind of lone ranger in there. And he, for me, he was always a kind of a wing back playing in the forwards. But with Hutchinson, you have a killer of a forward who wants to be a forward, who wants to stay in there, who's able to be patient. And he won't mind if he only gets four pucks in the ball on, on Saturday night because he could bag one, two from them four pucks. So I think Watford are well said. If I'm to be honest, I think when all is said and done, I think Kenny would probably have that little bit too much. Um, but Watford, the way they play, are going to be in this game all the way, I think, to the death, and they'll only be pointed to in it. But I just think Kilkenny, they seem to be even angrier than they normally are. I think the Richie Hogan thing last year has put a fair bee in their bonnet now. So they're uh, they're like lunatics. When they come out under the Hogan stand, they talk off actually in front of where the, the chippers are under the Hogan stand. They don't go into the dressing room at all. So when they come down the stand, the steps of the stand onto the pitch there, they'll be, they'll be angry as ever. And I just think they might have a little bit too much. Um, I suppose looking at the, the other game then with um, the following day with Galway and Limerick Limerick have been absolutely fantastic Like, um, but if any team has enough to beat Limerick I think it'll be Galway I think if Limerick get over Sunday they'll, they'll beat either Watford or Kilkenny in the final um, but this could be the banana skin I think for Limerick um, because Galway can score goals uh, and especially if Joe Canning goes to the edge of the square which I think Limerick or Gal well, Galway are going to have to do something different and for me, that'll mean rotating the forwards a lot more and taking Cod Cannon out the pitch and leaving Conor Whelan and Canning inside. And I think that will spell danger because the Galway or the Limerick full back line, Tom Morrissey aside, they aren't very big. So if they can get Canning on Sean Finn and get a couple of high balls in like we did with Larry and Noel Hickey, you never know your luck then from there. But I still think Limerick will, will win by a couple of points because they're the way they're playing at the moment, they understand they don't have to hammer teams, but they'll they'll do, I think, just enough to, to get across the line. 
but they're going to be some weekend of hurling now. I just can't wait. I'm working on both games now. It's going to be brilliant. And uh, Limerick and our water and Kilkenny this weekend, Jack. Uh, how do you see this one going? I'd say it'll be a tough one for Waterford after playing three weeks in a row and uh, with Kilkenny being kind of unexpected uh, winners and I'd say um, Waterford will want to keep a good lead going into the last stretch to get the win, I'd say, because Kilkenny will be fighting to the end all right. So I'd say it'll be a close one. Kind of sitting on the fence for this one. Jeez, you're, you're a fierce man for that. And yourself, Mr. Briggs? Very hard to call. Um, very hard to call. I think Jack is right about the three weeks. If it wasn't three weeks, and if Waterford had a week off, I, I'd fancy Waterford for this. But, like, Mr. Collins is always talking about the betting. And, you know, I wouldn't be one for that myself. But, like, if you look at the statistics over the last couple of years with the Leinster and Munster Championship the team that plays three weeks in a row in, invariably loses the third week against the team that has fresher and stronger now saying that I think that this Waterford team is at an age profile where they're, they're, they're not they, they're, they don't need that extra week bar one or two of them and like all along I've been pessimistic about their, their chances but you know what I'm starting to come around now uh I'm not converted to think that they, they'll win the All Ireland, but I'm starting to think that they can beat, they, they can definitely beat this Kilkenny team. And I think, you know, they need to match this Kilkenny team. And the one good thing about Waterford last week is their bench is also really, really good. So, like, you see Connor Gleeson coming off the bench, get two points the last day, Neil Montgomery, you see uh, the Darlines coming off the bench. And, you know, they, they, have a good, they have a good panel there now at the moment. So, all in all, you know, while I think it's going to be really close, do you know what, Adam? I'm going, to, I'm going to be optimistic this week and I'm going to go for a Waterford win. Yeah, uh, it's a tough one to call with uh, Kilkenny coming in off the back of the coming back late in the Leinster Championship or in the Leinster Final there. But uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to do a jack on it and sit in the fence. But uh, <laughs> at the same time, it's a very difficult one. But uh, I think Kilkenny might have just too much for the end of them. They seem to always find a way to kind of close out matches or just get the better in the end. So. And uh, moving on to our last match, then Galway and Limerick. Uh, how do you see that going, Mr. Briggs? I, I don't I, I don't think, I just don't see Galway winning enough primary possession. I keep saying this every week. I don't see them winning enough, pri- they're unbelievable hurlers. They're bringing the balls on the ground, but I don't see them winning enough primary possession against this Limerick team to trouble them. You know, Brendan was saying there to control Joe Canning in full forward for something different. But like Galway, to me, they haven't been looking this year like they're going to score a lot of goals. They're kind of going long range a lot of the time. Even Conor Whelan, most of his work has been done 40, 50 yards out from goal. There's nothing going to change my mind that Galway or that Limerick are not going to win the All-Ireland. So it's very firmly Limerick to win this one. And you, Jack? I'd say um, if Galway score goals like they did last weekend, I don't see why they can't be up there with, like close enough to Limerick but then again Limerick are just in top top form now and they've had a break so I'd say it would be Limerick to take it but I wouldn't be surprised if Galway were too far behind them Yeah Galway can only barely got over the line I suppose the last 10 minutes kind of separated them there but I'd say the red card for Tip had a big bearing on the game uh, but I'd definitely say Limerick now they look the, the farm team and uh, they want to beat this year, so I'm saying Limerick. And uh, what a weekend of hurling we have ahead. It's Waterford against uh, Kilkenny this Saturday at 6 o'clock in Croke Park. The very best look to all Waterford panel and management from us here in St. Declan's. Let's hope next week we'll be previewing the all Ireland final. A very special thanks to all my guests, especially Brendan Cummins for taking his time out to be with us today and we'll see you soon on Extra Time.